my amazing viewers. Thank you so much for joining me on my program once again. I appreciate you wherever you are connecting from. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please kindly subscribe to my channel. Click the notification bell so that you be notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you so much and remain blessed. Le Abe is a retired commissioner of police, a former commissioner of police in Kaduna State, pioneer commandant, mobile police training college in Osho State, as well as former Deputy Commissioner of Police Operations and Ambra Command. He joins us along with Zubair Abu Rauf, who is Community Leader, Burning Gwari, Kaduna State, and former Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer, Kaduna State Media Corporation, KSMC, Radio and Television, between 2002 and 2008. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. Mr. Abe, let me begin with you. We hope we'll be able to get... Uh, one or two other persons to join us this morning in this conversation. But you have served in Anambra State, Mr. Abe, and uh, there are those who are still as shocked as one can imagine uh, exactly what is happening in Anambra State. First of all, at the time you got this news, how did it come to you? Uh, thank you for having me on this program. Yeah, I served in Anambra State as the Deputy Commissioner of Police Operations. And uh, we had a lot of challenges, but uh, we were able then to solve a lot of these uh, security challenges. I can say that, and it's a record, but that was the period uh, one of the most notorious criminals in the number of states was arrested, uh, the Fabu. And uh, the, this incident, as, as a matter of fact, Came to me as a shock. I knew there were some level of uh, criminalities in the state, but the extent at which it was pushed was so shocking. Uh, the beheading of the lawmaker, and I think time has come for the talking to stop, and uh, we should initiate actions. Well, when this you man, yeah. Just a quick one. Uh, this man, please go ahead, complete the thoughts. This man, uh, each time I read from the pages of newspaper and they say that unknown government, I keep asking myself, where are these unknown government coming from? They come from within the society. This war is now supposed to be carried on by the general public within these communities because these men cannot come to cause havoc and uh, disappear into the same community and they are accepted and they live their normal lives. So uh, their time has come for us to really take action as a community and a people. What kind of action would you be proposing? Because there are those, for instance, the um, uh, chairman of the Southeast Governors Forum, uh, Governor Omar, he was saying that, you know, he thinks that this is largely politically motivated, some of the issues that are, that are going on now. The, the victim that we're talking about, for instance, you know, we understand just picked up a form to return to the House of, of Assembly in the same state, and, so, and then this. So one is wondering, in your opinion and from what you have seen, perhaps a few information that you may have been able to pick up, is this politically motivated or just sheer criminality? Uh, we should uh, be able to differentiate between political killings and criminalities. As far as I'm concerned, let's look at the basis for the activities of these uh, groups within the Southeast. They intend to create here, and one of the sources you can create here is to take it to the people in government. And I think as soon as they succeed in doing this, they try to establish the, their presence within the community. And I don't look at it wholly as a political killing because there are a lot of political activities going on and this is just one way they send their, their warning to the community that we can reach you whoever you are. I think we should keep uh, stop uh, associating a lot of these criminalities with politi politics. Politically motivated or not, which we've not been able to establish, government has in the past several times pointed accusing fingers at the prescribed IPOB. And IPOB has said, look, we're not responsible for the killings in the southeast, we're not responsible for the attacks. During your time as police commissioner, 
in Anambra, uh, perhaps you had made arrests. What, what, in which direction did your investigations point at? Did, does it absorb, did it absolve IPOB more often than not of um, guilt in much of the attacks in the southeast, particularly in, in, in Anambra where you served? I served in Anambra as uh, the Deputy Commissioner of Police Operations. And um, the activities of this group was, uh, I can say, much checked. Then it was more of MASOB, not IPOP, during our time in Anambra State. It was more of IPOP, and we took the war to them. We took the war to them, and so we were able to keep them completely away from the city centers, uh, and uh, they were restricted within uh, the forest areas. And periodically, we carry on uh, patrols and uh, checks with a joint uh, military exercise to this area. So I think between the 2011, 2012, and 13 that I left, the activities of this uh, woodlands was completely checked. Now, with um, the, the new governor's approach, meeting with the leader of the proscribed group, upon assumption of office, he offered amnesty to the groups and, uh, you know, uh, opened the door to dialogue. Yet, the, the attacks have not stopped. In fact, we have seen the killings heighten, especially over the weekend. What is, uh, what is this signaling uh, as far as whether the, uh, the events, the insecurity in Anambra in the southeast are politically motivated or not? I think we are not negotiating in the position of strength. <laughs> We are giving them uh, opportunity to make, uh, present their own cases. These people are uh, hoodlums, they are criminals, and honestly, we, a successful government has tried to call them to table and talk to them, but it's not working. We should, I uh, think, discourage ourselves from talking to these criminals. They are criminals. The law does not allow Mr. us Abbe, to Mr. who are criminals? Please be clear. These are um, hoodlums. Anybody that goes to the street with arms, kill at will, honestly, the Constitution does not favor that, and they are criminals. I, I are insist. you saying members of the group, the proscribed group, are criminals? Not the proscribed group, less. Not these people that are identified as the IPO, the MASO, are groups that are fighting for a presumed cause. But we are, they are telling you we are not the ones doing this. And I believe that, too, that they are not the ones doing it. The criminals hiding behind these uh, groups should be treated as such. IPOP has consistently told you that they are not the ones carrying out these uh, killings. They have come out to say so, and we believe that they are not the ones. So whoever is doing it are not IPOP or myself. They are criminals and should be treated as such. Well, um, it, it will seem as though, well... IPOB gives out that statement, but whether or not the government believes or at least holds that true is another thing entirely. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to our other guest in a moment, but I'd like you to speak to the MO uh, that we have seen in recent times, uh, the abduction, then the beheading, and then putting, displaying, either doing a video of it, of the process, or putting, you know, the severed head right there in public. Looking at that MO, what do you see? What do you think this is all about? Barbarism in the modern century. Barbarism and that cannot, should not be supported by any individual. That is one of the worst crimes ever committed in this country, honestly. And I think the law enforcement agencies in that state should go after the perpetrators of this act and bring them to book. This is not supposed to happen in this century at all. But what is that meant to achieve? I mean, you have seen some yeah. of these things over time. What do you think that is meant yeah. to achieve? And I imagine that there maybe should be a counter narrative from the authorities or from the stakeholders. So what, what is it meant to achieve? What kind of counter narrative should we put out there so we don't you know, lose this war on that, at least the propaganda or the psychological warfare mentality? And that is exactly what uh, this uh, perpetrator of this act want to convey to the society. Create total fear within the public and so that 
uh, their presence will elicit some kind of serious fear. And uh, I think this is the point at which the government should act and act decisively to kind of uh, reassure the members of the public that we are on top of the game. All right, let's take this to Mr. Abdurov, because what we're seeing, the, the security challenges, it's not just in the southeast, it's not just in Anambra, Imo, and others. We've also seen this pervasive, especially in the northwest. So we were shocked um, by the statement, well, maybe some weren't, but the statement made by the governor of Kaduna State uh, about, you know, terrorists, is it... Uh, uh, the, the Boko Haram, the Iswap, and the Ansaru finding a safe haven in Kaduna. Now, that's an area where at least you are familiar with. It's sort of home to you. But I'd like you to speak to this, the figures that came out. 360 people killed in the first three months. Breaking down that, that's 120 per month. That's four mm. people killed every day. Is, is this normal? Well, uh, the situation is not that normal. If you look at even the figures, uh, some of us that come from the Nungwari area and uh, also some parts of uh, Giwa local government area, where we consider as the epicenter of these uh, ambanditry kidnappings and what have you, uh, we look at even the figures are very minimal. Because when you look at what is happening on a daily basis, there was a time that in a single day, more than 30 people were killed. And I think the information didn't even reach even the authorities. So some of these killings may happen, but you know, the reportage of the event will not reach the security uh, personnel uh, or the government at that time. So if you look at the whole scenario of all this ambulatory and also kidnappings that have been happening and the security situation generally in Kaduna State, we can say that we have reached a precarious situation that we cannot be able you know, to say what ways are, are we going to curtail these uh, you know, uh, problems that emanated from all these uh, uh, terrorist uh, groups. Um, if you look at what is happening, you, you, the IGP said, you know, the Abuja Kaduna Highway is being under surveillance. Yes, I agree it's under surveillance, but there are some bad spots in which there must be, you know, a kind of a, a pin down where we can have, you know, the security personnel there. And that is why the moment, you know, this convoy of, um, uh, of, of security patrolling the Kabuja Kaduna Expressway, the moment they pass that area, so some of these bandits will take advantage of that and will come out and cause havoc. So, therefore, you see, uh, there must be, you know, a kind of strategy from the security agents, you know, to stop this madness. Honestly, 360 in three months, that is four people per day, when you look at it averagely, is on a very high side. And when you are looking at other areas, the remote areas where this issue happened, the southern Kaduna area, and also uh, this part of uh, Kaduna state, particularly Binogwari and Giwa, it is something that needs, you know, the presence of uh, this uh, security personnel. So also, there is a problem uh, that also is coming up. The Ansaru of a thing. If you look at uh, Giwa and Berlungwari, the Ansaru presence and dominance is, is still there. Nobody knows their motives. In some areas, the Ansaru are patrolling the roads. And you see them with their arms, with even the military uh, fatigue and what have you. So if you look at it, you won't know them, their mission. And some of the locals, they feel, you know, secured with this Ansaro of a thing. And that's why some of them have been cajoled into all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, terrorist group and what have you. So also, uh, you know, lack of uh, a kind of um, strategy from the, uh, from the security personnel, and that's what, you know, aggravates, you know, the problem of insecurity right. and also this figures that we are seeing. Mr. Abdurov, are you saying uh, that Ansaru has taken 
a foothold. Essentially, they are in charge of those areas because if they are patrolling in military fatigue, then it would speak a lot about just how much free hand they have to move. Are you saying they are in charge of those communities? Definitely, they are in charge. If you go from Maganda in Bernungwari local government to old Bernungwari up to Fontua, you will see these people. And even if you have a problem and your vehicle break down, these people will come to your head, will help you to jack up your car, remove the tire, take it to a vulcanizer in a nearby village, and also come and fix it. And even some of them will give you water and they will tell you bye-bye. They will not say anything to you. The Ansaru are in charge of this road. And if they spot any uh, armed bandit, you, you know, let me use, you know, the word. Although, you know, any planning bandits they saw along that road, they chase them away. So they are in charge of that road. Presently, I'm talking to you, that is how that road is. And that road is more secured than Kaduna to Bernungwari because the Ansaru were in charge of that Bernungwari football road. And that is why you have them. They are very, very prominent. They are very prominent in Bernungwari area, in the eastern part of Bernungwari, and some part of Giwa local government, notably in six ward of Giwa local government, notably Kidandan, Galadimawa, Katage, Yakawada, and to some extent, Panghoya. These are the places that you find this Ansaru. And also you have the bandits on the other side who are on the forest uh, of uh, UAC forest, Let where they have their farms. Let me get this right, uh, Mr. Abdurraouf. So you're saying that Ansaru, which is a terrorist group, am I right? Yes. So you're saying that, one, they are in charge, two, they're providing security for the communities such that they are now the ones fighting against the bandits. Am I yeah. right? Yes. Are, are the people okay with this? Do they like this arrangement? Well, the people, you know, are taking it. It's just like uh, a kind of, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's a situation whereby you, this one is a devil. You prefer a devil than also, you know, to have, you know, somebody that will come and, uh, uh, you know, uh, molest you or even uh, take over, you know, your community. This Ansaru present, as I'm telling you, is very, very prominent. Everybody who follow that road will feel secured, but the locals there, they are being indoctrinated into this kind of ideology of this splinter group. So that is what is happening in the whole of eastern part of Berlingwari, from Maganda, as I said, to Old Berlingwari, to Uyalo, to Dogwandawa, to Kazage, and also Kutebeshi. Therefore, you go to Idaso Ward in Kiwa local government area, and also some part of uh, uh, Kidanda Ward, you will find all these, uh, you know, terrorists, uh, you know, there. And the people feel more secure to be with those uh, uh, terrorists and Saru than with the bandits. It's a very dangerous situation. I'm just wondering if people understand the long-term implication, even though there are questions as to what really the people will be able to do by themselves. Yes, it's a very dangerous situation, but they don't have you know, a choice. Because uh, these bandits overrun communities, always. They overrun these communities. But with the coming of the Ansaru, the people were given, were given protection because even some of the places where all the security are being, you know, stationed, they are only stationed in some areas, but they cannot be able to go into those uh, uh, places where, you know, uh, the terrain is very difficult, is mountainous, and uh, a thick forest in those areas. And that is why the locals now, you know, take, you know, the, the, the doctrine of a devil advocate is preferably they feel secured with the bandit than, you, 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 than, than, than any other things because they are being given protection which, you know, our security personnel are not given that kind of protection. And that is why these people, you know, prefer 
uh, you know, the Ansaru to give them protection than to remain what they are to be overrun by these armed bandits, terrorists and bandits. Are they aware of what the long-term implication of that could be? Well, even if they are aware of what is uh, the long-term implication, because right now, you wouldn't know what sort of uh, agenda or what motives is the Ansaru have in those areas. Because they are there, they don't do anything to the locals, and what they are doing is to give protection to these locals and also to chase out all those terrorists that are overrunning communities in those areas, whereby the communities are helpless. So therefore, it is better, you know, to hold a double-edged sword than to wait to be overrun by bandits. And they prefer to take this uh, lesser evil, you know, so-called lesser evil, uh, Ansaru, than to be overrun by this, uh, uh, you know, armed bandits that are terrorizing communities in those areas. Perhaps I should ask, you know, what are your own fears? What do you think could be the long-term implication of this? The long-term implication, because they are recruiting the locals into their own ideology. So, therefore, and these people are armed, and the armed, you know, when they are armed, they are being taught, you know, a certain doctrine which is away from the normal Islamic, you know, doctrine that we can see. So in the long term, you see, these people will come out with their real motives. At the end of it all, these people that have been cajoled into joining the Ansaru group will now take charge or even, you know, go against their own communities. That will be the long term implication. Mm. And it's very dangerous. Let, let me quickly throw this now to Mr. Abi. Um, I mean, it, it, as we see in Kaduna, we also have a, a, an equally complex situation in Anambra. This is especially as you know we continue to see denials uh, by IPOB that this this is not them. Um, whatever is happening in Anambra is not them. Uh, who do you think? Because all of this started. Uh, this um, sit at home, um, uh, you know, some violence in the southeast seem to have started on the back of agitations. We saw it in Imo, we've seen it in Anambra, parts of Eboi have experienced it, even some parts of Abia. Uh, but right now we seem that Anambra is the one under focus. Uh, who do you think has a responsibility to say, you know what, we've looked at it and these are truly not IPOP agitators. Do you think that this should be the IPOP trying to prove that they're not the ones, or do you think that it should be the state trying to sift wit from Shaf? Uh, thank you, Malbert. I think time has come that we should view things in its real perspective. The Maso and IPOP, they have consistently come out to say, look, we are not the ones doing this. And uh, this agitation has lingered on for quite a long time. I think high time we sit back and consider doing some of the needfuls. Since these people are unknown and they appear to be uh, presenting a front before the government, and saying this violence, we are not the one creating it. We are for social reasons. I think we need to reconsider one issue and examine whether or not they actually have a genuine case and invite them to a, a table where we can discuss and resolve this issue once and for all to avoid this bloodletting and some other groups coming in, uh, in the name of IPOP or myself and creating hard work in the communities. I think 
Yeah. But what, what I find mm -hmm. disturbing is the, there's a conversation, Mr. Abe, if I may. I mean, there's a conversation already ongoing. Uh, we've seen moves by the current governor who has said from day one that he believes that there should be negotiation. He has visited uh, the, uh, the leader of the group, Mazenamdi Kanu, in, in DSS custody. Um, and Namdi Kanu has also said that, you know, he doesn't think that the way you know, he doesn't think that that's his IPOP doing those kinds of things. And if that is, you know, that they should stop those kinds of things. Um, negotiations are currently ongoing, but the killings are not abating. That, that's that's the, the, the troubling part of it. What I'm wondering is, shouldn't we be seeing a collaboration uh, between, uh, you know, IPOP and the state agents to actually fish out those who are, you know, perpetrating this evil in the southeast? I do believe too uh, that that should be done because, and uh, sometimes we look at the sincerity of government in doing certain things. And I think these IPO members are human beings and they belong to the southeastern region. And if they are convinced that the government uh, is honest and sincere about this move, I think they will come forward to resolve this issue. In the meantime, what do you think? Because right now we're not clear on the motives of those people. Um, communities are being attacked. This is not kidnapping for ransom. This is kidnapping to make a statement. Uh, the lawmaker who was kidnapped, um, his head was reportedly found in a motor park. You, you have to ask what exactly is the motive. There have been all manner of uh, gory. What exactly? Most times when criminals commit a crime, oftentimes there is some benefit, uh, you know, which accrues to them. For those who are rapists, they have their own benefits. For those who are kidnappers, one could see economic benefit. For those who are armed robbers, you could see the economic implications of that. But for this group of people, what precisely do they stand to benefit? To create fear, to make the people submit to them. Fear is the greatest benefit uh, such organization can achieve. Great fear. If they can go to the extent to uh, kill such a highly placed uh, individuals in the community, I think they have been able to establish themselves in that community and they are going to now be in perpetual control of their community and the people must now do exactly what they want to be done if we say don't go into politics don't go into an election campaign if you do this is going to be exactly what will happen to you they've been able to really big questions great fear I think it's important to state at this point that we try to get the uh, deputy superintendent of police and Police Public Relations Officer, uh, Mr. Ikenga Tuchuku, uh, who did say that he was going to join us on the program. We're still expecting that he will join us on the program. That's the uh, Police Public Relations Officer for the Anambra State Police Command. And it's to give a clearer view of what exactly, um, you know, is happening in Anambra State and perhaps reassure the people because uh, there are questions as to, you know, even going about business on the day that is not um, you know, regarded as a sit-at-home day. And there are questions as to whether ordinary, is this targeted as at politicians alone? Um, we're, we're yet to get him. We're hoping that uh, Mr. Ikenga Tuchuku will still join us at some point in this conversation. But let's take a moment. Right Thank you so much for your patience to watch from the beginning to the end. I hope you have learned something from the video you have just watched. The video you have just watched is to bring information to your doorstep and for educational purpose. It is not to demonize anybody. Let us watch continuously and see who can be able to make a sense out of every nonsense we are seeing. We must continue. We move. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. They will kill us. We will kill them. At the end of the day, Biafra is here. Thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, Please kindly subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell so that you notify each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you and remember us. Bye bye. See you again.
Thank you.